there and welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about functions in Go programming language. We're not going to get too deep. There are many more things we can say about functions, but we're at least going to start looking at it so you get comfortable. The objective for this video is just basically those two points. We want to understand what a function looks like in Go programming language and then learn how to define and use them, you know, to call functions. So that is basically it understand what a function look like and define some function learn how to use it so what is a function so before we talk about what it looks like what a function look like in go because in every program language functions have a different signature or syntax but what is a function really and so my definition is basically is a function is just a name given to a set of instructions and that's it you know you have a um, sort of set of instructions you either want to uh, reuse or uh, encapsul encapsulate in some way you just say I'm gonna put them in a function and give a function and give that a name so you can just recall that function name and have those set of instructions run or statement that's it now what is a function useful for well reuse you can uh, I can say have a function here and call it multiple places it help with organizing your code so sometimes you might only call a function once but you still <clears throat> might want to put certain things in a function because it just makes sense for those set of statements to go together and it also helps you with organizing your code. Um, when you want to deal with abstraction, you're like, well, I need to do some really complex instruction calculation here. I don't know exactly what it is. I'm just not though I need to provide X, Y, and Z and get back Y. And then you use a function and then you can go think about continue programming and then think about the details of that function later. So certainly it helps with abst abstraction and organizing your thoughts. So, you might be satisfied with me, my description or, of a, or my definition of a function. So let's just look at how you define one in Go. So this is how you, I will, what I call a name function. And so you introduce a function by giving the keyword F-U-N-C, then followed by a name, any name you choose, that's a legal name, just identifier. And then a argument list that's optional if the function take, um, arguments, which is what you provide to the function when you call it as its input. And then the return, you could think of that as the output from the function. So, um, and then of course the body. So that is the set of statement that represent the body. So it's just one body to the function. There's another format of function. This is the anonymous function syntax. And it's just a variable and you give the name and then equal sign. And then um, you type the function on the other side, the right side. If you notice that the function on the right side doesn't have a name, so we say, we've created an anonymous function and assigned that anonymous function to a variable. And you can pass an anonymous function around because in Go, functions are first class citizens. What that means is just like, oh, you can create a variable of type int or um, string, same way you can create a variable that's a function, and that's one way of doing it. We're not gonna really see an example of anonymous function in this video, so I show it, but we're not really gonna see any examples or play with it, you're free to try it. It looks just like that. Um, but we'll revisit anonymous function and some other things about functions in other videos. In this slide, I wanna spend some time talking about the argument list for our function. Just give you some example of what it might look like before we actually go look at the function, it's a full function. So in one, uh, there's an example of a function that you may create and ignore the return type and the body, just this part of it alone. And there's a function that takes no parameter. Um, second one is a function that take an integer parameter. And notice, again, just like um, creating a variable, you say var, variable name, and then the type. And as we know, type are optional when you create a variable. But here for the function, we have to specify the type, and we do not use the keyword var. But think of a parameter to a function almost like a variable. Third example, um, notice how we have three parameters that are all three of them are the same type. So we can simplify things instead of saying, a space flow 32 comma B space space flow 32 comma C space flow 32. We can just say A comma B comma C and then give the type and that applies to the three um, parameters of the same type. Of course, if you have different types, you can specify that also. Um, the final one is what is called a variadic um, function. Basically, is when you give a parameter and it must be the last one with that um, ellipsis, you know, the dot, 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 parameter name, and then the type. And what this means is that this function can be called with that parameter being optional. So you can not specify that parameter Z at all, 
So it appears the parameter appears zero time or it appears one or more time and times. So this is comes in usual a lot of places where you, um, well, a number of places where you might want to have a function that just take a variable number of parameters. And we've used functions like it. We've used the uh, FMT that print line function and sometimes we pass one parameter to it or sometimes we pass many. And that is how it's done, is by using variadic. It's a variadic function using the ability to take any number of parameters. Keep in mind, in mind that the last parameter, when you have a variadic function, the last parameter is the one that um, is the variadic parameter. So uh, let's look at the return list. So again, um, we're going to ignore what the parameter might look like um, to the function. Are we are saying that you can have a function with no return. That's the first example. You can have a function with one return value, and in this case, you're specifying the type, but you don't name what the return um, is. And the third example, you name the return. You still have one return, where you say here's an int. You can do that. Um, four, you see that oh, you can have multiple return values. Again, this is something that few programming languages have, but Google, um, Google Go has it. And same thing as when you have a parameter with the same type, you can just name them this way instead of having to repeat the type for each parameter. Or you can again have different type of parameters. Now notice here with the return list, you can specify a parentheses for, to represent the returns. If it's just one parameter being one uh, return value, then you don't have to use the parameter. But once it's more than one, then please do use the parentheses. Um, you, you can still use parentheses around one, it's just that it's not required for one. So, okay, let's look at some actual function here in definition. And so you can see on line 18, I define a function pretty much um, like the one I showed before, where it doesn't accept any parameter, does not return anything. The one after that on line 22, accept one parameter, a string. Um, the third one on line 20, start on line 26, accept two parameters, both of them of type int, and then returns an int. The one on third line 30 swaps the two parameters. It accepts int a and b and return b comma a. And that's one way of doing a swap function. And then the final example is a variadic function that accept any number of string parameters. So you can call it with none or one, two, except, et cetera. As you see in the, um, the slide here, where on, for my main function on line 11, I call a variadic function defined on line 34 with no parameters. And then on line 12, I call it with one and da da da. And inside that function, I'm printing out how many parameters um, was passed in of the art for art. Now, when you have a variadic function, um, it behaves a parameter. It behaves like an array. So in Google Go, we haven't covered array yet. I use the length method that's provided by the language to count how many, the length of that array, essentially, of that parameter, how many of them are provided. No surprise. If we run our program, um, we see the following result here in the bottom right. And again, nothing there that should be surprising. Uh, we're just using functions to print some statements and do some simple calculations. Okay, so there's one other thing I'd like to cover in this video about functions, and that's that they introduce their own scope. What it means is that within a function, you can think of it like a black box to the outside world where the caller cannot uh, manipulate the variables inside the function, and the function can create even more variables. Even variables that have this exact same name as variables outside the function in main. Now, we're going to cover scopes a little bit later on, and you'll see that if you have a variable in main or a package level, and so inside your function, you can use that variable, but if you happen to define a variable again inside the function with that name, then you kind of shadow it, you, you block it, right? But having your, your variable inside or being able to create variable inside a function is nothing unique to Go. Um, you, many other languages allow you to do that, uh, a lot of languages, actually. And so... What is really cool though in Go is that you can actually return the address of a local variable creating a function. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of it, but C and C++, this is not allowed or it's really dangerous to do. Just because of where the variable is allocated in the stack and how C and C++ sees that, that returning the address of something that you're going to create, a variable you're going to create and will eventually go away, automatic variable, in C 
is a very dangerous thing to do and it can cause the memory leaks. But in Go, that's not a problem. So I'm going to demonstrate not only creating your own variable in a function, but also being able to return the address of that variable after you leave the function. So here's a very simple application. Um, so another example, I have some function at line 9. I have this function that um, takes in a parameter i, and there's a, it creates a variable x, and it adds that input to the local variable, and it prints it out. Um, nothing again fancy there. Um, the next one, function on line 14, accepts a string and returns a string. And what it does there is it wraps the string that it, it gets with some stars. So you can think of it as pretty printing if you like. Um, or log in some, print some log information or something like that. Um, or something to um, grab your attention. Uh, the third one, line 19, um, doesn't accept anything. It creates a local variable pi. There's another way you can create a variable um, without specifying the type. And so you drop the var keyword and you just say name a variable colon equal and that's the same as if you said var pi equal. So you say var pi equals 3.145 or you can say pi colon equals. And it returns the address of pi. And then finally I have a function that accepts um, some you know, two parameters, but it returns three. So again, they don't need to be a uh, exact, uh, you know, one for one or anything like that in terms of the number of parameters that are provided and the number of parameters that are returned. And so we can see when we run this application that we have the address of that pointer. Now you may not be convinced that how this is legal to do, like and see if you try to do this or C++. Uh, you could potentially crash your program when you try to use that pointer outside of the function. After you return it, it would let you do that. It wouldn't complain. But then if you try to do references, and we talk about the references in chapter five, of, in section five of chapter two, um, then you would definitely run into some issues. Or was it section six in chapter two? But whatever. In either the previous video or the previous two videos, we talk about dereferencing, and so that would be a could be a problem. In Go, it would be totally safe to do. And so um, I didn't show it in the example, but I wanted to introduce one thing at a time. I don't want to focus on the whole dereferencing thing. We kind of talk about dereferencing, but eventually we'll see more, okay? So in closing, um, you start a function in Go by introducing it. You introduce a function in Go with the func keyword. Funks can optionally accept zero or more parameters as input. They can optionally return zero or more values as a return value. Uh, you could think that as an output as a function. And function create their own space in which you, the scope, sorry, their own scope where you can create um, other variables. And of course, functions can call functions. Um, for your Go program, you've been writing a function all the time, a main function. Um, it's just that it's given that how your program must have main that you probably didn't give it any thought. But that is a function. It's called main as the entry function to your application. So you've used main to call other function that you see in this example, and the same thing goes for the function you write, you can call other function. All right, so that's it for this video. I won't make it any longer. I hope you enjoy it and you learn something as usual. Take care, have a great day, and if you haven't subscribed, subscribe, spread the word. Appreciate it. Bye.